Well, you can join me in opening your Bibles to the book of Leviticus, and we'll be in Leviticus chapter 19. And so if you don't have a Bible, uh, please grab one under chairs nearby. We spend this time and just walk through a text of Scripture. So having the Bible open so you can follow along um, is important. And the text that we'll be looking at is on page 98 in those Bibles around the room. And before we pray, just a reminder of why, why it is so important that we open up God's Word and we hear it together this morning. Um, there's a couple verses that, are, um, that really sh- shape the whole purpose for why we spend extended time in a gathering like this, hearing from God's Word. And that's in 2 Timothy 3, and it says this. Paul's writing to a younger pastor named Timothy, and he speaks about how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings which in in this context would include the Old Testament and Leviticus, what we're going to be reading. And those sacred writings, including Leviticus, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So Leviticus makes us wise for salvation through faith in Christ. And then he says this, all Scripture is breathed out by God. So just as your words are breathed out by you, the Bible is breathed out by God. It's His speech to us, and it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. And then he goes on to give the central command in that final letter of his that we have, which is summarized in three words, which is preach the Word. So because the Bible, including Leviticus, makes us wise for salvation through Jesus, and it's God's very speech, preach the Word. And so that's why we do that. That's why we open up God's Word, and that's why we uh, even go to God in prayer here to ask Him to do what only He can do through this. So let's pray together. Our Father, we thank You for breathing out the Scriptures and therefore giving us this sacred Word that we can trust, more trustworthy than any other book, any other writing, any other speech on the planet. And so in this time, we pray that You'd give us an openness to your word, a mind to understand, a heart to embrace, and lives transformed by the Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, we're, we are jumping back into our series on Leviticus. We took a short break for Advent and a couple of weeks on preaching and prayer, and we have seen that Leviticus has a reputation for being boring but it is actually deep and relevant. So one of our longtime and well-loved uh, members, Joey Chapman, many of you know recently passed away, and she loved studying and talking about God's Word. And we, as we began this series in Leviticus, she had said to me that spending time in Leviticus is exciting. And so that is not the reputation Leviticus has. So my hope is that Leviticus would continue to shift for us Um, if it needs to, from boring um, or opaque to clear and exciting. Because it's, it's about Jesus, it makes us wise for salvation in Jesus, and it's about the life He's restoring for us. So we're calling this series, Restoring the Life We Lost in Eden, and that's because you really can't understand Leviticus without understanding Eden. So the Bible begins with this beautiful picture of humanity with this flourishing, joyful life with God and with one another, and then our first parents lost it because of their sin, and the world is now messed up, and the Bible's the story of God's plan to give, the, give it back to us and better in a new creation forever. So Leviticus is about restoring that life that we lost in Eden, and this morning we re-enter this in the middle of chapter 19. And we get a glimpse of the ethical life that God is restoring for His people. This chapter is filled with commands. Now, we could read this, and we'll read it in a moment, and think that this is largely irrelevant for us. But this is relevant, and it's irrelevant in two important ways. First of all, chapter 19, and the second half is what we'll look at, this is God's Word for us. So, it's true that this was originally given to Israel And much of it is applied directly to them in their unique historical, cultural context in their covenant with God, and therefore it's not as directly relevant in the same way for us, but this is still God's Word for us. And there's principles here of God's love and ethics here. And the second reason this is relevant is because many people dismiss Christianity and Jesus altogether partly because of this chapter, Leviticus 19. They charge Christians with being inconsistent, and they quote commands from this chapter 
to make the point. So if a Christian says, believe marriage is between one man and one woman, they say, but do you obey Leviticus 19's command to not wear clothes with mixed materials? And some people are asking these questions honestly, and we owe them honest answers. And so it's not okay for Christians today to ignore Leviticus 19 and the important questions people ask of this. So this is all especially relevant for you if you are in high school or college. At some point, you need to figure out what to do with Leviticus 19 as a Christian. So I want us to think this through. I want to help us think this through this morning. So let's read this text together. Leviticus 19, beginning in verse 19. You shall keep my statutes. You shall not let your cattle breed with a different kind. You shall not sow your field with two kinds of seed, nor shall you wear a garment of cloth made of two kinds of material. If a man lies sexually with a woman who is a slave assigned to another man and not yet ransomed or given her freedom, a distinction shall be made. They shall not be put to death because she was not free, but he shall bring his compensation to the Lord to the entrance of the tent of meeting, a ram for a guilt offering. And the priest shall make atonement for him with the ram of the guilt offering before the Lord for his sin that he committed. And he shall be forgiven for the sin that he's committed. When you come into the land and plant any kind of tree for food, then you shall regard its fruit as forbidden. Three years it shall be forbidden to you, you must not be eaten. And in the fourth year, all its fruit shall be holy, an offering of praise to the Lord. But in the fifth year, you may eat of its fruit to increase its yield for you. I am the Lord your God. You shall not eat any flesh with the blood in it. You shall not interpret omens or tell fortunes. You shall not round off the hair of, on your temples or mar the edges of your beard. You shall not make any cuts on your body for the dead or tattoo yourselves. I am the Lord. Do not profane your daughter by making her a prostitute lest the land fall into prostitution and the land become full of depravity. You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. Do not turn to mediums or necromancers. Do not seek them out and so make yourselves unclean by them. I am the Lord your God. You shall stand up before the gray head and honor the face of an old man and you shall fear your God. I am the Lord. When a stranger sojourns with you in your land, you shall not do him wrong. You shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. You shall do no wrong in judgment in measures of length or weight or quantity. You shall have just balances, just weights, and just ephah, and a just hin. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And you shall observe all my statutes and all my rules and do them. I am the Lord. So the big topic of this text is ethics or obedience to God's commands. And so here's the big point. We are to reflect God's holy love in all of life by keeping his commands. So here's how we'll engage with this text. First, we'll see what obedience is all about, then what it looks like, and finally, how to do this. So three points. The big picture, which is what obedience is about, the specific examples, and then its ongoing relevance for us. So first, the big picture. Um, sometimes in biblical text, you can find the main idea by looking at the beginning and the ending of the text, and that's the case here. There's a phrase that introduces and concludes this whole section. It's in verse 19 and 37. The phrase is, you shall keep my statutes. So this whole section is about one main thing, learning to keep God's statutes. This is about obedience to God. Now, that's pretty obvious. These are commands, so of course the idea is to obey them. But here's why it's worth pausing uh, to emphasize. Because many people in practice think that obeying, they are obeying God just because they're familiar with what He commands. Right? If you survey a handful of Christians and ask, do you think you obey God's commands? I think many, most would probably say, well, of course not perfectly, but yeah, more or less. And many Christians don't read the Bible. They actually don't know what God commands. 
but they're broadly familiar with them. And so just familiarity with God's commands makes us think, and then just kind of thinking, well, I'm not a terrible person. I know really bad people. So yeah, more or less, I'm doing this. Even though I'm not really thinking about any specific command any given time of day, I'm not actually trying to obey. I'm not repenting when I don't. But we just have this general sense that we're okay. Martin Luther, though, once said something like, everyone loves God's commands until they actually start trying to obey them. So what does it actually look like? Well, here's the big picture of the whole chapter. I mentioned this a moment ago. Here's what it means to keep God's commands. We're to reflect God's holy love in all of life. That's the big picture of our text. This is what we saw a few months ago when we looked at the first half of this chapter as well. That's what it means to keep God's commands. So the first part of that, we are to reflect God's holy love. That's what the whole chapter's about. So rewind a little bit and look back at verse 2. This introduces this whole chapter, which we're in. God calls Israel to be holy because I am holy. So this is about being like God and in particular, being holy as God is holy. So every command in this chapter is serving this bigger purpose of helping people be holy because God is holy. God's commands reveal his character so that we can see how to reflect his character. And the emphasis is on God's holiness. What's his holiness? Well, Jonathan Edwards summarized God's holiness as his infinite beauty. It's the beauty of his moral character. Of course, not everyone thinks that God has a beautiful moral moral character. Um, I'm convinced it's true, and the Bible does show this. It's the beauty of who he is. So to be holy means to be devoted to God and to live with moral beauty. It's to live your life in school, in your home, in your neighborhood, in your workplace, alone, privately. It's to live in such a way that there is um, an ethical aesthetic. Right? There's a beauty to the moral choices you are making and the value judgments you are making and how you live. And at the heart of this ethic is love. The key verse, verses in this whole chapter make this clear. So we're looking at the second half of the chapter. There's two halves. And the key command in both chapters is kind of the climax of it. The climax of the first half of the chapter is verse 18. Love your neighbor as yourself. So that's where Jesus is quoting from. Love your neighbor as yourself. Summarizes the whole law. And then the second half of the chapter, moving toward the end of it, it says love the sojourner as yourself. So the heart of God's command is always love. Whenever you come to a command of the Bible, you can ask the question, how does this embody God's holy love? Love for God, love for others. So God's command gave us a vision for how to reflect his character, and in particular, his holiness and his love, his moral beauty in love. And this is in all of life. So if you scan through this section we read, you can see that the commands touch every part of life. So these commands are personal. We've got to deal with them as individuals. They're also social. There's relational implications. They have implications for work and vocation, business practices with the justice in the end. It touches on the marketplace and the courtroom. They address any situation when you're in the presence of someone of older age. There's no priority in the order of the commands either because all of life is sacred. So the big picture is this, which is interesting because you think of Leviticus and you might think tabernacle, there is this sacred secular divide, but actually Leviticus gives us a holistic picture of all of life. So the big picture is we're to reflect God's holy love in every moment of our day, in every area of life. And we do this by obeying his commands. Keep my statutes, he says. You know, when you see someone who actually lives this way, not just someone who more or less thinks they're obeying God because they're familiar with his commands, but someone who's actually living this way. They know the Bible, they read the Bible, they, they apply the Bible, they live it out. There, there's something compelling about their life. There's a moral magnetism to them. There's a moral beauty or this ethical aesthetic in their life. It's because when someone actually lives like this, they are embodying and reflecting God's own morally beautiful character of love. So what does this then actually look like? So that's the big picture. Now, second, specific examples. So as we look at these various commands, we'll walk through them all briefly here. We we have to keep a couple things in mind. 
First of all, these commands were always meant to be examples to illustrate deeper principles. This was never meant to be an exhaustive list. These commands are illustrative of deep principles. And then second, some of these are going to sound pretty strange to us, and they did as we just read it. These were given to a specific nation in a specific, specific cultural context, and they were part of the old covenant. So these are not to be obeyed directly by all God's people for all, dot God, all time as they're stated here. Jesus has come. He's brought all of this to its fulfillment in Him. And so the way that we as Christians relate to this has changed. So what we're going to try to do is understand the deeper principles of love here in their context and then reflect on how this relates to us. So the first set of commands sounds the strangest to us, I think. The idea is not mixing things together. So look at verse 19 again with me. You shall not let your cattle breed with a different kind. You shall not sow your field with two kinds of seed, nor shall you wear a garment of cloth made of two kinds of material. It's one of the most quoted commands from Leviticus today. People quote this and say, see, the Bible has ridiculous commands. You can't take it morally seriously. And the implication is that you shouldn't then embrace other commands that don't fit with how our culture views love and defines love today, like with sexuality. So if you do, then you're just picking and choosing what you want to obey, right? You pick, you pick the commands about sexuality you think are important, you dismiss the other ones. You're inconsistent. I'm sure most of you have heard that. Maybe you think that. So let's think it through. The part that troubles people is most is about not wearing clothes with two kinds of material. So what would the rationale be for that? Well, many scholars have noted that you have to understand this in the big picture of Leviticus and Exodus. This whole book, and if you were here in the fall, we spent a lot of time looking at this in, in detail with Leviticus. The whole book is setting up a symbol-laden culture around the tabernacle. The tabernacle is the center of their life. Israel circled around the whole thing, and the key idea has to do with degrees of holiness. God is in the center of this, in the most holy place. Outward from there is the holy place. Out from there is the courtyard around the tent. And then you have Israel around that. And then you have the nations far beyond. And then there's degrees of holiness of the people who can be led into each sphere. So the high priest who can enter in the most holy place is most holy. Then you have the priests who are allowed in the holy place. And then you have normal Israelites and then other nations. And do you know what we find at the very center of this? If you kind of looked in there at the very center, that once a day when the high priest is in there at the very center, what do you find? You find mixed fabrics, interestingly enough. The high priest's clothes have mixed materials. And then interestingly, the ordinary priests, further away from this center of holiness, they have less mixing, but just a little bit of mixed fabrics, but still some. And then the tabernacle curtains are made of mixed materials. So the key idea seems to be that for Israel, mixed materials were symbolic of the holy, the realm of the holy. It's connected in some way symbolically to God's presence. And the point is that Israel was to embrace this symbol-laden setup, even down to their clothing and to their food and to the animals they could touch. And the point is then that they embrace this, and so they're not to dress as priests. They're not to dress as the high priest and associate in that way. They were to wear clothes fitting for the area outside the tabernacle, less holy. So that's not arbitrary, it seems. It was fitting with the whole symbol-laden culture that God gave Israel. So here's a way to think about it, um, how we do this kind of thing today, actually. Uh, so I used to uh, do Taekwondo. And when you start, you have a white uniform with a white belt, right? And then you progress, and your belt changes colors, right? Yellow, green, blue, and so forth, all the way up to black belt. When you get to the black belt, you also get to add more black, 
to your uniform. So you get piping down your shoulders and sleeves and pants and then on some of the trim. And so imagine then if a yellow belt started putting on the black piping. That wouldn't work because that's associated with the realm of the black belts. There's a clear distinction between every other belt and the black belts. The black belts are in this realm with black belts, black trim. Or even further, could you imagine if a yellow belt decided to just show up with a black belt, right? It would mess with the whole symbolic setup of the thing, right? So it would disrespect the setup. So that's probably the kind of idea that's going on here. So this isn't just an arbitrary random command. It's part of a whole symbolic setup for Israel. So to say, don't mix things together in giving these examples is perhaps partly related to the idea of um, not violating this setup here. And that's probably also what's going on by not mixing seeds in a field, by the way, which is also mentioned here. Some of these commands are repeated in Deuteronomy, and they give a little more uh, explanation. And in this case, it says that if you do that by mixing seeds in a field, it says this, this field is forfeit. And actually, the word there means holy. The field is holy. It's devoted to God. Well, that's interesting. You mix the seeds, and it's holy. Again, mixing associated with the realm of the holy. And so it's devoted to God. So what about obeying this? I mean, you may think, I don't like that. Well, it was the symbolic setup. So even if we don't like it, it's still, we can understand it, right? The point is it's not arbitrary. It made sense in their setup there. So what about obeying this today? Well, this isn't intended to be universal for all people in all times. In fact, the high priests were allowed to wear mixed garments or mixed cloths, right? Mixed materials in their cloths. So this was part of a temporary symbolic world for ordinary Israelites. It was a setup preparing people for the coming of Jesus. It all pointed forward, every bit of it, the tabernacle especially, and the priest and sacrifice to Jesus coming. And now that he's come, he's brought this whole system to fulfillment, and it's therefore over because fulfilled in him. He's made people, his people, into priests. We're made holy in Christ. So for us now, if you're wearing polyester and cotton mixed together here, if you've kind of early on checked your tag or something, you're fine. Um, This command isn't ridiculous or arbitrary when you think it through, though. It makes sense in the context of Leviticus and the whole story of the Bible. So I took extra time with this one because of how important this is for our cultural moment, especially in conversations with people who don't understand the Bible, who don't understand that there's a beginning, middle, end, and that this comes before Jesus, and we're on the other side of the cross, and therefore that matters how we relate to these commands. And the commands themselves were not ridiculous. They did make sense in their context. So we'll go more quickly through the rest of these. The next command is about the consequences of premarital sex with a servant woman. So slavery at this time was not the same as we often think of it. It's more like indentured servitude or a temporary apprenticeship to help someone get out of debt. And the main point here is to show how the man who does this needs to make a guilt or reparation offering because he's sinned. Then there's a command about trees. So you can plant a tree, but you can't use its fruit for three years, and then the fourth year it's set apart for God, and then the fifth year you can eat it. So this is actually just applying to fruit trees the principle of giving God your first fruits, which he set up for Israel. The reason why you wait for three years is because the tree doesn't make much fruit in those first three years. So if you're thinking, hey, how about this? I'll actually give God not just one year of fruit, three years of fruit, but it's kind of just the meager stuff you weren't going to use anyway, right? That's offensive, That's not expressing gratefulness to God, right? That's like the commands about not giving the injured animals as sacrifices. You give him the best. So first three years, you wait for it to actually start producing fruit. And then the fourth year, you give him your best. You give him the first fruits, and then you eat. It's a way of expressing gratefulness to God. Now in verses 27 and 28, these are often referenced as well. So let's read these. You shall not round off the hair on your temples, which is why some people who take this literally still today, will let that hair keep growing, or mar the edges of your beard. You shall not make any cuts on your body for the dead or tattoo yourselves. You've heard this one reference before. Why not? These are all associated with pagan practices surrounding in the surrounding culture. So notice that it says, don't cut your body for the dead. 
That's important. And when these commands are picked up elsewhere like Deuteronomy, that phrase is added to some of these other commands as well. So when these are references about being done for the dead, so Israelites were not to participate in pagan mourning practices. That's the point of these. So what does that mean for us? Well, you can pull your sleeves back up if you kind of pull, put them down right now. Um, it's not a universal prohibition against tattoos. In fact, Revelation 19 symbolically portrays Jesus returning tatted up, King of kings, Lord of lords, tattooed on his thigh. So it's not inherently wrong. Now, you may not think it's wise, you may think it's gaudy, you may think it's a waste of money, but if you don't have real Bible verses that apply to Christians today, then that's your opinion. And we can have, give all kinds of latitude to one another on this topic. So you can have household rules about these things, but this command is not one you can quote and say, see, it's sinful. Instead, there's a principle then of not associating with pagan cults, idolatry, or the occult, or dressing like or doing things that associates you with that. And there's implications of that for today. The next verse prohibits making daughters into prostitutes, probably directly against the surrounding cultures as well that were filled with this. And they had celebrated that because they connected it with worship. So they'd have prostitution at temples as acts of worship. And God is saying, no, we're not going to do that. And we, of course, need to hear this deeper principle as well in our hypersexualized culture. Verse 31 commands against engaging with the occult. So the surrounding cultures were filled with mediums who would try to contact the dead for people. We may think that's a thing of the past or for movies like Ghost. Um, but it's making a comeback. Various occult practices are gaining momentum in the culture. I don't know if you've seen this. It's growing in popularity here, especially as our culture moves increasingly post-Christian. Uh, people actually want to embrace some things that are part of other cultures or heritage just because they feel like, hey, it's been so hush-hush and been so condemned. Let's kind of pull this stuff back. And it's making its inroads in ways that are very subtle. So the idea of kind of manifesting things by thinking of them. Have you heard of that? It's all over social media. Manifest it. Um, Eastern New Age practices of meditation. So biblical meditation is taking God's Word and filling our mind with it. Uh, meditation today often means clearing your mind or filling it with lies about how beautiful you are and how great you are and how rich you are so that you become beautiful and rich. Verse 32 shifts a bit fo of focus on honoring age. You shall stand up before the gray head and honor the face of an old man and you shall fear or revere your God. So this is creating a culture that honors age. A culture where youth despises the elderly is a culture that's unraveling. We are in an unraveling culture. That's why it's so important to especially honor our parents, especially as they age. We all begin by depending on them, and then at some point, if the Lord continues to give years, they depend on us, and we need to embrace that with gladness. Our culture will be making, it seems, more and more decisions related to this, especially related to the health care costs for the elderly. I saw a headline this last week just noting the cost benefits related to cutting end-of-life health care. So these are all value-laden conversations, and we have to decide are we going to value life or money? And the principle here is you honor life and you honor age. Verses 33 to 34 relate to how we treat immigrants, certainly relevant to us today. So let's read this one carefully. When a stranger sojourns with you in your land, you shall not do him wrong. You shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as the native among you. And you shall love him as yourself, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. So let's just try, if we can, to bracket out for a moment whatever political or policy things we value right now, and just grasp the principle here and let it shape us. God is saying something radical here. He's saying, treat the sojourners from other nations that come into your nation, he's saying, treat them as well as you'd treat the natives. 
He says, you are to love them as you love yourself. So look at the motivation. He's saying, remember where you came from. He says, you weren't always here. You were sojourners in Egypt, and I rescued you. I've loved you. He's appealing to their empathy there. He's appealing to their experience of their own redemption and gospel grace from God. So how do we take this and apply it to our own cultural situation in America? Well, there's not a one-to-one correspondence with Israel then and America now. And we often go wrong in our thinking in a lot of ways with the Old Testament when we just think we can take verses that, are, that were given to Israel and just speak them to America as if we're kind of God's chosen nation or something like that. So that's, we have to be really careful. But there are connections. We may be citizens of a country and sojourners come to a country we live in just like they did there. And so we can think this through carefully, but also seriously. So here's one key observation. Let's make a distinction between someone who needs help and someone who seeks harm. So if someone comes to our country, and just apply this, if you move to another country, this should apply to any other country. I'm not just speaking of America here, but any country, if someone comes to your country for help and not to harm, you should welcome them. We should be happy to provide a pathway for belonging and to citizenship. And we should do what we can do to make a wise and good process for that. If someone comes to your country to harm, though, then it's not loving to overlook that and ignore that. The whole point of this command is to care for the vulnerable. It does not honor the vulnerable to let anyone come here who may have harmful intent against the vulnerable because they'll harm them. And so here's what this means. It means we have to avoid just aligning with polarized takes. On one end, to simply say, everyone's welcome, end of discussion, is probably not enough. Because in our current situation, many people are flooding into our nation, and we have no good process right now to help those who need help and restrain those who seek harm. It's actually unloving to the vulnerable to let hundreds of thousands in without any vetting process. And we've hardly begun to see the negative consequences of this. On the other side, to say, keep them out, send them back, is not right. That would be the problem on the other end of the spectrum. It would be to communicate that we actually have no interest in helping those who need help. We should want to establish processes to love the sojourner. So don't hear what I'm not saying. Both general parties and policies and platforms are not morally equivalent on this or most things, so I'm not doing that here. What I am saying is the more extreme edges um, and kind of unnuanced takes do not reflect the wisdom and love that's embodied here in God's Word. So we want to take that seriously. And remember the motivation here. God is saying, for you were sojourners to them. There's a deeper principle here. We welcome others as God has welcomed us. And this applies to all sorts of situations. So let's just forget national stuff right now. There's a principle here. There's a tendency in all of us to climb up a ladder and then want to pull it up behind us, right? We do that in towns, right? We come into a town and we think, I love this place. I love the population. Let's just cap it now. Let me in, but then no one else after me. You join an organization or a board, and you're like, man, this is great. I'm glad I'm led into this thing. And then they're like, we should grow this. We need more of it. No, no, no. Pull up the ladder. We have enough now, right? Um, Or longtime members of churches can start overlooking and devaluing newer members. So sometimes a church has existed for generations, and a family has been part of a church for generations, and they can start to feel territorial, start treating people who have been there for less time as less important. Or even just shorter term, maybe you've been sitting where you're sitting for a few years now, and someone comes in on a Sunday sojourning among us. We should feel very happy about that. And if they are sitting in your seat, your seat, when you come, please let your first thought be, thank you, Lord, for bringing that person. 
I'm happily going to sit somewhere else. And you can probably prevent getting in that situation. You just mix it up anyways, right? So just leave, leave the seat. It's not yours anyway. Sit somewhere else for a while. Let's just make sure those patterns can be here. Now, I say this. Some of you do such a great job with this. But I have heard stories over time of people feeling rejected because they come in and they get a look from somebody and they know what's going on. They're sitting in someone else's apparent seat, right? So we don't want any, any bit of that, right? We love and welcome others as the Lord and the church before us has welcomed us. So there's deeper principles of love here. So finally, the chapter ends with justice and business practices, those last verses. Big point we're seeing is that Jesus is relevant to every moment of life. We're to reflect God's holy love. This is how he treats us in all of life, every circumstance. Okay, final point point then, ongoing relevance. How do we take this chapter, live in light of it today? Well, we've been considering this as we've gone. Let me just bring up a few things as we end. First, notice how Jesus ratchets up the principles here in this chapter. Two central commands of this chapter. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love the sojourner as yourself. Jesus summarized the law as loving God and loving others. Every command here is ultimately putting this principle of love into action in some way. But then Jesus ratchets it up even more because this chapter says love your neighbor and love the sojourner. Jesus came and he said, love your enemy. So we're to live a life of love for God and for others and even love for enemies. Second, when we come to any text like this, we also need to have quickly in our mind the Lord's Prayer, which we saw last week, forgive us our sins. Because we come to God's commands and our first response or only response cannot just be, I'm going to do them, but I have failed to do these. Israel was given these commands, and they didn't keep them. They failed generation after generation. The heart of these commands was to love, and they didn't love God or others. That's why Jesus came. He came to a world that fails to live out these kinds of commands. And God knew that when he gave these commands because he was preparing for Jesus all along. And Jesus came to be the only one who perfectly fulfilled this law of love. And then he died so that we could be forgiven our sins And then he rose and he poured out his spirit so that now finally he can have a people who actually live out this culture of love. So for all of us, we don't just need to hear God's commands and say, let's do them. We always need to remember first we need forgiveness and we'll keep needing forgiveness. So we receive it from Jesus. And then third, we obey God's commands with gospel motivation. Remember how God motivated Israel here. Love the sojourner for you were sojourners. I rescued you, right? The the Bible is filled with this kind of logic in the old and the new. Love one another as I've loved you. Love one another as I've loved you in Jesus. And so he's appealing to their experience of grace here. And that's always how God motivates us. Jesus first loves us. We receive that, embrace that, let it saturate our minds and hearts and change us and melt us and warm us. And then we extend that to others. We treat others as Jesus treats us. The motivation for a life of love is never to earn God's favor. It's never to prove our worth. It's never about a chance to show our quality. It's always to respond to God's love. So there's three ways to view obedience to God's commands like this, and only one of them's right. The first is legalism. We obey God's commands in order to be accepted by him. We think we can just pull all of this off with our own hard work, and then we'll be good enough to be accepted. The second is license, which says we actually don't need to obey these. God gives commands just so that we would say we can't do it. Jesus did it, and we need his forgiveness. And now obedience really doesn't matter. He doesn't expect it of us, and we don't need to care about this. The third is the gospel way, and this is the biblical way, and it's the only way that actually works anyway. We obey because... God has first accepted us. We don't obey in order to get acceptance. We obey because we already have it. We love, and love then obeys his commands because he first loved us. So enjoying God's love and grace is actually the only way that any one of us 
is going to even want to obey God in a way that truly fulfills this. Because God is not looking for people who don't know that they're loved and don't love Him back, but who are really good at getting a checklist of commands done. That misses the whole point. To actually love God and love others, we have to be transformed by His love for us. And then we'll reflect His holy love. So let's pray together. Our Father, we thank You for Your Word, and we were reminded at the beginning here that every word of the sacred writings is breathed out by you. This is your speech to us. And so we want to be open. We want to receive it. We want to understand it rightly with our minds, but we want to receive this in our hearts and we want to live transformed. And so we're depending on you to continue to work and continue to renew us and let us live with this moral beauty of holy love that you show. In Jesus' name, amen.